You are listening to the Next Play Podcast, the playbook for high-performing leaders who want to exceed their full potential. From walking on the Ole Miss football team at 5'7", 150 pounds, and earning a full D1 scholarship, to coaching thousands around the world and working with massive organizations like IBM, I've learned countless lessons that I'll be sharing right here with you. Join me as I interview some of the most successful people so you too can learn how to focus on always moving forward by deciding, planning, and executing on the next play relentlessly. All right, this is Richie Contartesi with the Next Play Podcast, and today we have a very special guest, someone who's a best-selling author, someone who has shared the stage with people like Tony Robbins, Les Brown, Brendan Bouchard, Bob Proctor, Robert Kiyosaki, Gary V, Grant Cardone, Magic Johnson, and more. He's spoken at 10X, so he's obviously a badass. Um, and his latest book, Is It Time, Money, Freedom, uh, is a must read. So he's he has his own reality show called Play to Win and also gives back to March of Dimes, I think over 600,000. Is that right? Or you helped to raise over 600,000? Yeah. Yeah. We've, we've done, uh, we've done a few, few things over, <laughs> we're now, uh, over a million dollars that we've either raised or, you know, and also, per, you know, participated in. That's awesome, man. That's awesome. So he is the CEO of the Higdon group and he is voted one of Inc's 5,000 fastest growing companies in America. So I'm super excited to have him on here. Someone who's spoken on some big stages, who has a lot of experience, who's built uh, multiple companies, including an eight figure company. Is that, am I, am I hitting that one? Right. Um, eight figures. Yeah. We've, I mean, we've done, you know, over 30 million in sales. Yeah. 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 They're killing it. So talk, let's just, I just want to start with the book because if you're listening to this right now, you need to go get it. Time, money, freedom. Walk me through that. Yeah. So, and as of last week, the paperback just, just came out. Oh, let's go. What's cool about that is this this version contains the Grant Cardone forward. <laughs> so nice. Grant Grant wrote us the forward, and but he didn't get it to us in time when we published the hardback. And so everyone that has the hardback does not have his forward. Anyone that gets the paperback gets his forward. So nice. Um, it's kind of and funny. that says but, a lot, man. I seen you, you've been on his set, like yeah, you know that 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 says a lot. Yeah, no, he's, he's, he's great. He's incredible. Um, but the book, but the book itself is uh, 10 simple rules to redefine what's possible and radically reshape your life. So this is for the person that has a desire to improve their finances, relationships, and, uh, and possibly their own emotions. You know, uh, a lot of the people that I coach, they, make a lot of money. Um, you know, I have, um, you know, one client, he makes four to $5 million a month, um, doesn't have a ton of overhead. And when, when I started coaching with him, he, you know, had what, it, you know, every watch you can imagine, every shoe you can imagine all the, all the toys and, and everything, but he just didn't feel good about it all. He didn't, he didn't feel good about the rest of his life and, and being a dad, et cetera. And, um, you know, it's now been, 90 days as of like yesterday. And he's like a changed person, man. His wife told me he's like, she's never seen him like this. I mean, he's just, it's just awesome. And so um, for someone that wants to improve how they feel, it's, it's not just hardcore, here's how to improve your marketing statistics, but we talk about marketing, um, but it's, um, you know, how to improve your finances, relationships, and your emotions. Your EQ. So how did you get into that? Because your story is really, really powerful. How did you get mm-hmm. into the, you know, the, the EQ, the emotional coaching, how'd you get to into that? Yeah. So, you know, it's interesting. I, one of the topics that I've always, I've always been asked to, to speak about is consistency and, you know, cause I'm, I'm, you know, kind of a freak of nature when it comes to consistency. You know, I, I, July 15th of 2009, I started doing a video a day and I didn't miss a day until mid July, 2021. <laughs> so 12 years later. And, and so people have always asked me, and so there's been different phases. So 
in through 2009 to like maybe 2013, I would just teach, here's a good daily routine. And I would just, oh, here's what you do. And, and I would look around and no one would do it. Like literally nobody, like everyone would be like, oh yeah, they take notes and they'd say, ooh, ooh, that's good. Oh, I didn't even think about that. And so I'm like, yeah, I'm doing something. But then upon follow-up and observation, I'm like, no one's doing this. Like, right. what the hell? So I, I, I kind of went in her and I said, okay, why do I do it? And I realized that back then my level of awareness was the reason I do it is because I have a vision of who I want to become. So I'm like, okay, got it. So I, I, now I start teaching vision and the percentage increases. It goes from zero, to maybe 7%, right? Huge improvement, about 7% right, right. of people. <laughs> now, now <laughs> better they, than zero, about, but nothing better right. than zero. And, and so about 7% is my guess of people that would hear that and be, oh, wow. You know? And, and so I'm still like scratching my head. I'm like, why, why, why is so few people doing this? And then I ask again, I'm like, why am I doing this? And I came up with a very different answer. And I came up with a different answer depending on the person. So my high level of consistency was actually a coping mechanism for my low self-esteem. Mm -hmm. So I was working really, really hard every single day because I was trying to fill a hole in my self-worth that can't be filled by that. Mm -hmm. And so I would, you know, to you know, not spend time with me and understand me, I would work, you know, to not spend time with family, because I, I wasn't, I, I didn't know how to operate there, I would work, to not spend time with with friends, I would work. And so work was my, actually my coping mechanism. So if I'm a workaholic, then I'm not having to learn some of those other skills that scare me or go into other areas that actually scare me, like connecting with others, like playing with my kids. You know, I don't like saying that, but I know so many people out there, especially dads that struggle with spending time with their kids. Two minutes in, they're looking at their phone. And that was me for most of my life. And I have a 23-year-old, a 21-year-old, a six-year-old, and a two-year-old. And so um, now with that awareness of, oh, wait a minute, um, you know, I'm aware that this is why I'm operating this way. I can now be like the next play, right? Yeah, the next yeah, yeah. play of after awareness is defiance. Mm. I became defiant to that program. So now I get to choose how I show up in the world. Now, most people, I bet, I bet a lot of people listen to this, their coping mechanism is being a workaholic too. For sure. But what about the people that don't work hard? What are the, pe the people that struggle with consistency? That's a different angle. The reason so, that they can I just pot, this is really, really good, man. I just want to yeah. get dive into this for a second. So, so the whole is actually self doubt. That's what you're saying. It's like it, it, because you felt self doubt, you would work because you what so, actually caused you to say, I need to fill the void, I need to constantly work. What was that? Um, so you could say self-doubt if you categorized it a certain way. So self-doubt in this kind of context sounds like I'm, I'm not sure about my business abilities. I'm very sure about my business abilities, but I did have self-doubt when it came to connecting and trusting others. Got it. Okay. And so it was actually, I would classify it more as a self-worth. Like mm. if, I'm, if I'm teaching you something, then I'm valuable the and helpful. But yeah. if you're just my buddy and you, I can't bring value to the table, what is my actual worth here? And, and so it was, you know, it was a self, it was self-doubt in those certain scenarios and a self, an overall self-worth thing. So when you see people that are just workaholics and post in their highlights, the roles and the phantom and the this and the that, um, they're usually, what I found, they're usually trying to fill a hole that can't be filled that way. So if I wanted to plant trees, I wouldn't go buy banjos. Makes yeah. no sense. Right they're, right. they're different things. Yeah. But yeah. If, you, if you think that if I only buy enough banjos, then I'll solve the tree problem. Well, you'll keep buying banjos, but it'll never get solved. Right. And that's, that's how a lot of workaholics uh, operate. So what's the hole then? What's the hole that they're trying to fill by doing that, by posting? Feeling them, better being... about themselves. Mm. And why, why do you feel, feel better about myself? So let me make others feel better about me. 
So let me go get the accolades and let me go get the results and let me go hit the leaderboard and let me go crush it in sales. And I, I sure hope it'll get, it'll get other people to feel better about me. And maybe if they feel better about me, maybe I'll feel better about me, but it doesn't work that way. You won't feel better about you doing that right there. It just Got it. Never work out. So it's, it's more of an inner thing of, of an awareness of, wait a minute, I need to, <laughs> yeah, I need to figure out something else to fill that, that hole. Got it. Got it. So, so, so walk me through how you coach people to get to that point where they feel better about themselves. Like, cause that, yeah. that is, that's definitely a thing. And I can tell you right now, a lot of people listening to this, you hit it right on the money, definitely yeah. work themselves to avoid what, what you're referring to right now. Yeah. So, so how do you coach people through that? Like, what is yeah. that? Um, so and, and, and just to quickly touch on it, if you're listening to this and you're not consistent, that is a very different problem. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. You were getting into that. I, I yeah, just yeah. want to, you know, because some people are like, well, I'm not a workaholic. I don't do the work. The reason you, if you're <laughs> listening to this, the reason you're not consistent is because you're drawing the wrong conclusion to success based on an observation you made as a kid. So if you're listening to this and you're trying to get pumped up, motivated and, and learn some different things but you're not, you're not showing up. It's because you believe that if you cross a certain threshold, if you break through an upper limit, if you become that thing that you think you want to become, you'll change. And it's because of your childhood. If you watched your really common one, um, if you watched your parents uh, succeed at a high level, then lose it, you may have very well, very likely created a program that said, well, if I make a bunch of money, I'm just going to lose it and be ridiculed. So subconsciously, if you never want to fall off the mountain, you'll never climb it. So as soon as you start to have success, you'll actually get more stressed out. <laughs> oh, wow. And so you think you're doing better, but you're actually like, you know, you're like, oh my God, when's the shoe going to drop? When, when am I going to lose it all? And one thing that I got, you know, to witness is actually from my wife, my wife, uh, she saw her mom go from, you know, very well off to losing it all and borrowing money from family members and friends and just total devastation. And so when we first, when my wife and I first met, we've been married 10 years. Um, I was broke. I'd lost it all in real estate. I mean, I was dead broke. She's paying for my, she's paying my utility bills. And, oh, wow. but you know what? We weren't stressed. We start making, you know, 300,000 a year. 700,000 a year, million dollars a year, right? And all of a sudden stress skyrockets. All of a sudden she's sweating the bills like, wait, I'm like, why, why is she? I, I think we're doing better. We're, wait, we're doing a lot better, but she's yeah. more stressed out. So for her, it was, you know, without an awareness, you'll, you'll, it's like a ticking time bomb. And so for that, that's for the, the folks that uh, aren't consistent. Got it. So, Go ahead. Back to your to your yeah. question of how, how do I coach someone uh, through this is one, just look at step one is what area of your life do you know that you can and should improve? And I heard, um, you know, I've been saying that for a long time. And then I heard um, Jordan Peterson say it once. And I'm like, yeah, yeah, that's that's a great question. Um, but what you know, what area is it spending time with kids? Is it connecting with friends? Is it uh, unwinding? Is what is it that you know you could do better at? Maybe you think that you're an introvert. And what you'll find with people that classify themselves as introverts is there's a point in their life where they were really hurt. And to prevent them from being hurt, they, they will often try to um, disallow connection. And, you know, so if, if you want to, you know, get in close with them, all of a sudden the introvert, you know, kicks in and that's a protection mechanism. Right. Right. And, and so um, it's number one, where, where is it you think you could do better, better or should do better? Number two, where are you triggered? When, when do you get triggered? When, when do you have an emotional response? Is it when the kid screams is it when, you know, someone challenges you? Is it when someone, you know, uh, gives you instructions in a certain way? Like what, what really, you know, triggers you? And let's find out why do you have that emotional addiction? Why do you have that? Why do you react that way every time? Because there's a reason. And, right. and it's usually a protection mechanism. And then what was your relationship with your parents? 
How did you see them in that role? So another common example, if you had really successful parents, but they ignored you, you may have very well drawn the conclusion that, oh, successful parents don't treat their kids right. So I'm, I'm not going to be really successful. Right. Got it. And so you, re you rebel against that. Right. Um, or um, without understanding and aware and, and being aware of it, you become exactly like them. So I think it was last Friday, I coached a lady live on my Facebook page. And I said, you know, she was struggling with, with money. And I told her, uh, well, tell me, tell me, what was your parents' relationship to money? And she described it. And I kind of waited and she didn't get it. I'm like, you realize you just described exactly how you're being with money, right? And she's like, oh my God. Like, I mean, it, it is, you know, and that's what, yeah. the, that's what your programs will do is they try to camouflage themselves. They don't want you to figure them out because they're there to protect you, not hurt you not prevent you from reaching a potential, but protect you. Um, I coached a, a lady a couple of weeks ago and, and, you know, she was just like kind of muddling through life and, and not really, she knew she had more potential, but she just wouldn't tap into it. And I said, at what point in your childhood did you draw the conclusion that no matter how hard you tried, it just didn't matter. Right. That's a big question. And she said, you know what? I remember this day where, you know, I, I, I did a bunch of stuff with my easy bake oven. I made my dad a brownie. I made him a cookie. I made him this. And, and when he got home, he yelled at me because I used the kitchen materials. And uh, I don't know that I've tried very hard after that. And so if you, can, if you have kids, you know, and, and you know, this kind of stuff, like I'm always like, okay, when's the program going to be set? Like, <laughs> when, right. let, let me, let me be aware. Let me not fly off the handle. And, and, and if I do, I better create the meaning for, you know, for my, my kids or else they're going to create their own meaning. And so we're meaning making machines. And, and so we, we create a meaning we create, Oh, Oh, this happened. Then this happened. Oh, that's what that means. Okay. The program is set and it's with you the rest of your life. Even if oh, you wow. forgive your parents, you know, you can right. forgive your dad, forgive your, that's so how do you do the program. So how do you overcome that programming? Awareness is first. Awareness is the very first step of getting out of the emotional addiction of just being on autopilot. So my first one I discovered was I'll show you. So if someone doubted me, I, I'd puff up and I, I'll show you. And, and I would go do that thing that they doubted me, whether I wanted to do it or not. See, I was the passenger. So my, my best example is in like 1999, I think, um, maybe 98, I was, I was working at a, uh, a telemarketing company and one of my friends was the head of, of computers. And I said, Hey, I don't know anything about computers. Like, I, you know, I, you know, could you teach me computers, man? Cause I should probably know something. Like I didn't know anything about computers. Yeah. And, and so he's like, sure, man. And so he's showing me and he's like, all right, right click. And I'm like, what, like, what, what do you mean? Like, I literally don't know anything about computers. Right, and he's right. like, oh man, you could never do computers. I didn't know it, but the next seven years of my life I spent in computers, I went to Redmond, Washington and was oh, about wow. to take <laughs> a job with Microsoft. Like that's how lunatic I am. And all of that, like, I didn't even like computers, but I, I, even though I, I stayed, I didn't even stay in touch with him. Like this whole time I'm trying to prove something, right? And that's just a program. So when I became aware of it, I can still see it flare. It doesn't flare very much anymore, but for many years, even with awareness, it would still, still flare up. Um, another one is from uh, Betrayal is, you know, being, you know, I, I, I didn't know why, and I talk about this a lot in the, in the book, um, but I didn't know why I had such, such high social anxiety. I would go speak at an event and, you know, biggest event I spoke at, there's over 20,000 people in the live audience and like, you know, a standing ovation. Yay. And I would come off stage and I would just have so much social anxiety. I'd want to rush back to my hotel room and just sit there. And I didn't know why, why is that? you know, what, what is wrong with me? Right. Yeah. And it's because it actually came from, uh, in the third grade, in the third grade, I had a, uh, you know, I came from a very abusive home and my third grade teacher knew something, something's off with this kid and had me start meeting with the guidance counselor. So I start meeting with the guidance counselor and 
you know, it was nice. I'm, I'm, you know, someone's listening to me. No one ever listened to me. I couldn't have friends over. I wasn't allowed to go to other people's houses. I had to stay outside till the sun was down and then go in my room until they told me to go to bed. So like I was by myself all the time, never talking with anybody. And, um, and so I start sharing some of the stories and, you know, there's some pretty, you know, messed up stories. And then one day I show up for our meeting and it's, her, uh, my guidance counselor, my dad, and my stepmom. And she proceeds to tell them every story I've ever told her because she thought they were too outrageous and that I needed more attention. They didn't believe it's true. That was a bad day. That was a very bad day, as you can imagine, when I got home. Um, But it was a really bad day because that's the day I set the program to not trust anyone. So the reason for my social anxiety is if I keep everyone at bay, they just won't like me that much. And so they'll never get close enough to hurt me. And I didn't know that. I mean, I didn't, it's not like I'm thinking that, right? Like that's in the back of my head. That's a program that was set. And I remember the first time I shared that story, it was, um, you know, because I, I only uncovered this like, you know, less than three years ago. And I talk about it in the book, but uh, I remember sharing on stage, I was in New Orleans and one of my clients came up to me and he said, wow, that makes so much sense, you know, because this is my first time sharing it. And he said, I just thought you didn't like me. And that really that like broke my heart because I thought about all the decades of people that probably just think I'm egotistical, jerk, don't like them, you know, whatever programs they're running, I played right into. And it's and that wasn't the case at all. It was just a unawareness of a protection mechanism being played out. And so um, so step one is, is awareness, which is very hard you know, it's very hard when you're, you know, you're up so close to it, but I can get outside perspective. Hey, exactly. You know, like, um, you know, one of my clients, she is, uh, you know, makes a million dollars a month from her company. And, you know, that's where, that's where she wanted to go. She wanted to crush it. She, she did, but I helped her recognize that her negative feelings about that was exactly what her dad did to her. And, you know, nothing sexual or anything, but it's exactly the scenario. They're the, they're the same scenario. And with her, you know, becoming aware of that, now she can make a choice. Because if you're not aware, you're not, you're on autopilot. You don't right. make a choice. The program right. makes the choice. And you're just along for the ride. You're just careening off the cliff. You're just taking the left, right? You, you don't have any say in the matter. You're the passenger. And so step one is awareness. Step two is defiance. So become defiant to the program. And defiance is, um, it's actually the name of our our next book. Uh, It's not out yet, but defiance is where, where can I start to establish that I'm the master and I'm in control? And this is a very powerful exercise. So most people that go on, you know, diets, right? What do the diet gurus say? Well, go into your pantry and throw away the Cheetos, the Doritos, the burritos and the whatever else, right? I don't want you to do that because actually that means that you're too weak to be around those things. I want you to be around them. I want you to be able to walk through the valley of the shadow of death and have burritos, Cheetos, whatever, cheesies, whatever. I want all that shit all around you. And, but you're defiant because you've decided you're the master, you're in control. It's one of the reasons that I started doing cold showers. I started doing things I didn't want to do. And, and establishing that I'm, I'm the master, I'm in control. And when people can establish that, then it's, what else can I do? You know, I'm not, I'm not crazy about heights. So I went skydiving, <laughs> you know? And so like, nice. what, where can you be more defiant in your life? I, I want you to see that delicious last piece of pizza, not eat it. I want you to throw it away or give it away, whatever, right? Um, yeah. People say people are starving. Well, they're not getting that piece of pizza, I don't think. But anyway. Uh, so I want you, you know, to establish more defiance because after defiance, you can do anything because now you're not ran by the programs. You're not, you're not the, the passenger. You're not the, you know, just the unaware. Why am I unhappy? You know, right. And you can change that. You become defiant to noticing the things in your life you don't like and start focusing on the things that you do want. So how does one become defiant? Like, let's say for just use the. I think the, the, the eating one is a good one. Like, you know, if I'm somebody who's always eaten burritos and Cheetos, how, do, how do I, you know, by keeping it there, cause I've heard the opposite as well. So I, by keeping it there, I like this idea. How do I, how do I train myself or learn, or how do you teach to be yeah. defiant? Good question. Um, 
And, and looking and looking at the alternative first is, okay, if you rid your house, what about when you're at your neighbor's? What about when you're at a restaurant? Right. right what about right. when you're at a cookout or a birthday party or anywhere else on the planet, you're going to have access to that stuff or at the grocery store and no one's looking. Right. And so like, <laughs> if I can get you defiant, then you, I can, I can drop ship you to, you know, wherever the greatest buffet on planet earth. Right. And, and you're, you're going to be, you're going to be okay. Yeah. So I want you, the unit to become more powerful, not just to be in a, a more powerful setting for a certain percentage of your life. Um, so that's number one to understand. Uh, number two is it, it could be small. It could be, um, you know what, when I used to play with my kids after approximately two to three minutes, I would be looking at my phone and I'd be like, not present at all. And so defiance would be, let me take this phone. Let me, maybe I set a 20 minute timer on it and I put it in a drawer. I can't access it. That would be practicing. That would be building that defiance muscle, right? So passing the piece of pizza, that's building the defiance muscle, doing the cold shower, you know, it's good for you. And if you don't Google it, and you'll find all these different, you know, results, right? Um, so doing that thing I know is good for me, but I don't want to do. That's how you build that muscle. And the more of that you do. One of the big ones for me was uh, meditation. When I first started meditating, um, and I've, I've been meditating every day now for a little bit over a year or something like that. But when I first started, you know, like, you know, they, they want you in, in the meditation that I do from uh, Dr. Joe Dispenza, they want you to sit up. Right. And so I'm sitting up and, you know, one, you know, two minutes in my shoulders kind of aching, you know, my back kind of hurts, you know, I'm kind of, so I'm meditating like this and, and my mind is racing. So I'm, I'm like really meditating here. Right. Um, well now, I mean, I've done four hour meditations without moving a muscle. I oh, even had uh, one hours? time I'm, I was doing an hour meditation and two minutes in, a fly landed on my face and crawled on my face for the whole hour. I didn't move a muscle. And so I've built that, that muscle of, of defiance. I'm the master. I'm in control, regardless of what the hell's going on around me or what options I have, I am presented. I'm the master I'm in control. And I, and I practice that every single day. And so it's, you know, could be as small as, Hey, I don't want to go and, and, you know, spend time with the kids or I don't, I want that piece of pizza, but I'm not going to eat it. And the more of that you build, the more you're going to say, what else can I do? Got it. And so what do you feel like this awareness and defiance for you has done for you? Like what's been the end result for you by, mm. by practicing this? Because well, now one, you're obviously, you did it and now you're teaching others, right? Yeah. So one, I mean, I, I you know, it's, I, I, I'll give you my answer, but my favorite response is, when people have asked my wife that answer and she said she had no idea how great our relationship could be. And this is, you know, we've been married 10 years, right? We we've always had a good relationship. We've not argued much at all, really no big, huge fights or anything like that. But, you know, she's told me, you know, since, since, since this kind of transformation, she's told me, she goes, you know, um, you used to get upset a lot. And I, I didn't even realize that. I didn't think I did, but you know, she's, she's telling me this and uh, it used to be, you know, it used to be really difficult with, you know, you just really struggled spending time with the kids. Cause you know, I don't, I don't remember one time in my life, in my childhood that my dad played with me. I didn't, I didn't get that. I didn't have that childhood. I don't remember one ball thrown. I don't remember one at a boy. I don't remember any of that. And, and so um, you know, part of it was just learning, you know, how, how to be okay spending time with the kids. Cause I didn't, I didn't experience that. And so I would say, um, uh, better, according to my wife, better husband, better dad. There was a time when my daughter, um, I really thought she just didn't want to spend time with me to be honest. And it, and it hurt. And recently my wife asked her, what's your favorite thing to do? And she said, play with daddy which just melted my heart. Um, no more racing thoughts. So I don't, you know, I just don't, I, I'm just not, you know, at the, um, you know, uh, at the victimhood of whatever my thoughts are thinking, I'm in control, you know, so I'm, I'm just, I don't have the racing thoughts anymore. Um, I have um, just a, a lot different energy. People tell me all the time that have known me for a long time. They're like, dude, your energy is just like so different now. 
And, and me going through that transformation uh, has led me to the two mantras that now run my life, which are uh, help the person you used to be. And we have to be as brave as the people who need us. So those two mantras, uh, which I came up with through this process, they, that's what really runs my life. So help the person you used to be. Well, I mean, I grew up abused. I, I've been dead broke. I went through foreclosure. Uh, I was addicted to drugs. I was deeply depressed. I was suicidal. Um, you know, I was a workaholic, had, had no concept of joy. You know, I would go accomplish things, but I, I, it didn't change my feeling. I, I didn't, I would go chase another dopamine hit, which would never change me. Right. And then number two, be as brave as the people who need us. I think about all the people who've been through some of these different challenges and um, that, you know, me being vulnerable, you know, may in some people's eyes, like if someone likes the flashy, the bling, the, the bada bing, I'm not their guy, but, you know, that's OK. I have to be vulnerable and share my story in it. And it's continuing. I haven't arrived. I'm still working on, you know, different things and wanting to improve myself. But that's going to help a lot of people that, you know, can recognize, um, you know, their issues, you know, what they're what they have gone through or overcome and, and how I can help them. Yeah. So what was the turning point for you? Like you said, you know, you had the all those things happen to you and you were depressed and you were a workaholic and you were, um, you know, foreclosure. What, what was the turning point where you where you, you know, made the change? And then obviously you said in the last three years, you've come up with, you know, the awareness defiance. And is there, a, is there a third step to that? Those would be the two, like, how did you come, when did the change happen? And then what's the rest of the, or is that the, the two steps? Um, I mean, after, you know, aware, awareness defiance and, and then it's designed the life that you want because you now know you're in control. And, and so, you know, that's, but without that, if I just say design the life you want, you know, you're in control without awareness and defiance, you're actually not, you're not in control. Your emotions are, your, your program is, your memories are. Um, and so, you know, this, it's not, it's not like one thing that happened um, specifically from foreclosure. What happened is, you know, I was in uh, real estate. I was a real estate investor from 2000 four ish to, you know, 2009 here in Florida. And so when the market crashed, I got like so many people got wiped out, you know, over a million dollars in debt, uh, multiple foreclosures, um, you know, business partner, you know, he went back, he went back to a job very smartly. I probably should have, but um, <laughs> I just tried to write it out and figure it out and just spent all of the money I'd ever made my entire life. And so I'm, depressed. I'm broke. Um, I'm, you know, in the process, I think at that point, no, I had, I wasn't fully divorced yet, but I was, we were separated and um, <clears throat> I didn't know what I was going to do. And someone invited me to an event, a seminar. And, and I thought maybe I'll learn how to make some money because that's what I need. And so I go to the seminar and then, uh, and it was landmark forum, just to give them a shout out. And day two of that seminar, I realized that repair relationship with dad was on a to-do list with no priority. And what happens with things on a to-do list with no priority is you lose the opportunity. And so on day two of that event, I hadn't talked to him in 13 years. And, you know, I had every reason not to, you know, he looked the other way while I went through, you know, sheer hell as a kid. And, but I wouldn't feel good if he passed away and I didn't at least try to reconnect. And he had never met his grandsons uh, at the time. I think there were nine and 10 or something like that. And so on day two of that seminar, I reach out to him and I say, hey, I'd love for you to meet uh, you know, my sons, your grandsons. I'd love to have some kind of relationship with you. I don't know what it looks like exactly. And, uh, and he said, okay. And you know, went up to Indiana and that was uh, first week of July in 2009. And you know what? Uh, something was created out of nothing. And it, you know, it certainly isn't perfect. It never was, but it was something. And I came home and something was different. It was like I'd let go of baggage, I'd let go of, you know, resentment, anger, whatever. And that next week 
from being home from Indiana, I was introduced to the company that I went on to become the number one income earner of. It was a network marketing company, which I had sworn off network marketing, but you know, I, I didn't have a lot of options. Right. Um, and I'm like, you know what, I'm going to make this damn thing happen. And so I did became the number one earner in that company, made millions of dollars with that company. And, uh, but the second benefit of that whole thing was the very first time I shared that story. I was in Myrtle beach. A guy had asked me to, to come up there and, uh, and I share that story. I shared, you know, connecting with my, I was, I was actually, uh, called to talk about it so like so i never had this happen before but i was just it was just like talk about your dad it was like you know like like just thrown in my head and i'd never experienced that and so i'm like okay and so i, yeah. I tell that story the guy that booked me for that event his name's kenneth and he after i finished telling that exact story he's walking down the aisle tears just running down his face i mean he's like really sobbing and i said you know wow that you know, that really touched you. And he said, I can't believe you just shared that story. I haven't talked to my dad in 17 years. And tomorrow I fly out for his funeral. Oh man. I was like, Whoa, like, like, you know, my, my back then, my first reaction was beat myself up. Right. I was on a webinar with him a week ago. If only I would have shared, maybe he would have connected. And then the second reaction was one more of wisdom. And that is I need to be more vulnerable. Because back then I was still putting on the show. I was still like everything perfect over here. <laughs> and, and so like I was Superman, you know, and on stage and everything and, you know, didn't want to show any flaws, got to be tough. And, and that just made me realize. And so since then I've shared that story thousands of times, I have hundreds and hundreds of letters and emails and messages from people that have reconnected with mom, dad, sister, brother, son, daughter, um, people have changed their lives because, you know, because I shared that story and I have three examples of someone who heard the story, reconnected, all three are dads, um, reconnected with their dad and shortly thereafter, their dad died. But they did before. They did it before. So, li so like literally they had to hear my story in this specific time, right? They connected, then they lost, you know, they would have lost the chance. And, and so, I'm um, just very, I'm always grateful to, to share that story because I know someone needs, needs to hear it, you know, holding on. I had every right to hold on to resentment and anger and, um, but letting that go changed my life. I didn't know it would have a financial return. Uh, that wasn't, you know, the plan, but it did. I mean, that's what right. turned me around from million dollars in debt to making millions of dollars a year. Right. So that was your awareness moment at that conference when you said to yourself, wow, like this is something that had happened in my past that's been blocking you from? I think, you know what, I don't, I have to, you know, like uh, Steve Jobs talks about in his Stanford address, um, connecting the dots backwards is, is, you know, pretty easy. I don't think at the time I was like, oh, uh, I'm, right, I right, right, right. Stuff and now I can <laughs> rock and roll. Yeah. Uh, I don't, I don't think I got that. But what I, what I did get is when I heard Kenneth say that, and I saw how that affected him, I did get that that's what I need to be doing more of. I need to be doing more of sharing my, you know, my, um, you know, scars, you know, of sharing, you know, what I overcome and encouraging others to do the same, right? Because it's not just about me, but it's about, you know, anyone, whatever you've overcome or survived, there are people out there that aren't sure they can, and they need to hear your story, right? Maybe they're not inspired by my story, but they're, they're you know, they're inspired by your story. Right. Everyone has different, yeah. So, so real quick, just in our we have a little bit of time here left, time, money, freedom. What, you know, share with share with the audience here what what they can take away from that. I want to make sure that everyone gets a copy of that. Yeah, for sure. So, you know, we talk about you know how to improve your your finances. So there's there's chapters on how to make more money from home. There's chapters on how to improve your money mindset. There's chapters on um, how to make a bigger impact. The probably the most popular or the most popular um, chapter is uh, called Pluck the Weeds. And Pluck the Weeds, you know, you may draw the conclusion that that means to get all the negative people out of your life. And that may be part of it. But Pluck the Weeds is you look at every area of your life and you set, you ask yourself, 
what is incongruent with who I want to be? And so my, you know, big thing that, that for me was, I didn't like it that I didn't like social events, that I had such social anxiety. And in the book, I talk about, we were at a charity auction and uh, our neighbor comes up and, and says, uh, hey, did you see the trip to Belize? And I'm like, no. And she goes, oh my God, it's, you know, five days. It's, it's uh, you know, five couples. It's on a private jet, private yacht, private chef, private island. And my wife is like, Ooh, like she's, you know, super excited about this. And me, to me, that sounds like hell on earth. It sounds like the worst thing ever. Like to me, that sounds terrible, but I don't know why. I don't know why, but that, that's my initial thought. I'm like, oh, great. <laughs> I hope we don't get it. And, and so as we're leaving that night, I was just, I'm driving and it's kind of, it's bothering me. I'm, and I look at my wife and I always want to be like, you know, a, I want to be a great husband. I want to earn her love every day. I want to, you know, I want to be legendary husband, legendary dad as well. And so I'm driving, I'm like, what the hell's wrong with me? You know, like why, like, you know, she deserves, she doesn't deserve someone that's the, I don't like that thing. Let's not do it. She, she deserves someone that's energetically matched to her because her reaction is definitely the right reaction. Yeah, for sure. And so I, I decided to, to dig in. And so I worked with um, some, I don't know if you know, uh, Elliot Rowe, but I worked with Elliot Rowe. He'd be a great interview for your podcast if, yeah. if he's, um, you know, if he's doing that. But um, he's a, you know, he, he coaches like quite a few of the top 10 poker players in the world, quite a few of the top 10 uh, UFC fighters. He's oh, a wow. performance coach that is also a hypnotist. And, and I went to him, I said, Hey, man, I want to figure this out. Why, why did that freak me out? He's the guy that led me to remember that that story about the guidance counselor, I'd forgotten it. I didn't, that was I. but he he through hypnosis, he helped me remember that I'm like, Oh, yeah, that was like a big deal. But I, my memory had totally blocked it, because your programs don't want you to figure them out. Right, right. The cool thing is we did end up winning that trip. We did go on it two weeks ago and it was oh, yeah. awesome. It was awesome. really, really cool. I didn't have any social anxiety about it. That part of me has really, you know, it's been eradicated. I just, I just don't get that anymore. And so I, I'm, I tend to hang out after I speak now. I tend to not shy away and go, you know, with anxiety back to my room. And, uh, and I'm not the one, you know, tugging on my wife. Hey, let's, let's leave this party. I just got rid of that. And that's through awareness and, and defiance. Dude, that's amazing, man. That's so awesome. And, and I, I'm, I, I really, really think it's important that you go and get his book, Time, Money, Freedom, because we all have things in our childhood and in our past that uh, create roadblocks for us that we're unaware of. And yeah. so, um, you know, if you're listening and it, you could be in your 30s, 40s, 50s or 60s, and have gone your whole life without realizing it. It's never too late. So um, if you feel like there's there's you know blocks in your life because there is, um, I definitely definitely suggest going and get his book, Time, Money, Freedom, uh, and they can get anywhere, right? Amazon. Yeah. Like that. Oh, actually, um, we have a um, I have an interview I did with Grant, and it's awesome. It's entertaining. It's cool. But again, Grant Cardone wrote the wrote the Ford and. Um, I did an interview with them and that's actually on, uh, you know what? I can't, I think I can upload that to Amazon. I should do that, but it's on uh, tmfbook.com, tmf okay. time, money, freedom book.com. And you can see that uh, interview with grant. It's, it's really, really good. Yeah. Yeah. Go there. TMF it's TMF book book.com. Okay. Yeah. Go there. That's the, that's the best place to go. Okay, cool. Well, Ray, I really appreciate you being on here. I think it was yeah. really insightful and I hope that, you know, I feel pretty confident that you at least opened uh, one's eyes to to have awareness and be like, oh, I do have some blocks and um, and to learn to be defiant. So tmfbook.com. Ray, thank you so much for, for being on the show, man. Thanks for having me, man. Absolutely. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Next Play Podcast. If you liked the show, make sure to leave us a review. For more resources, visit relentlessuniversity.com or download the free Relentless University app. And if you're interested in having me speak at your next event, visit relentlessrichie.com. Until next time.